And while it is coming up, Bruce mentioned the double blessing this week. I think it was rather timely. I don't know that it's happened before. It may be normal and it may not be. But I found it interesting that this was the week that held uh, Memorial Day for Israel when she remembers all of her fallen soldiers who have fought in all the battles through time that has uh, been a part of the backbone of Israel. And at the same time, the double blessing is they celebrated their Independence Day. They are 3,000 years old, 72 years young. And I love that uh, signs all over Israel that are saying that. And uh, we rejoice that there is an Israel. We know that there is because of our God, that uh, he is keeping his word. He had promised that there would always be an Israel, and there is. And okay, what I see in front of me is just simply, oh, okay, I see what you're trying to do. Are you able to? <laughs> We're still working with a little bit of technical difficulty while Roger is doing that, and then I'll get that, hopefully, stamp of approval from you all. Uh, we are in our building, our holy place. Uh, is this it? Is this what it's going to be? Okay, I have no one to know if they're seeing anything. So if it's not good, someone light up Roger's phone because I'm using my phone as a tablet tonight. So if I turn around, okay. Okay, then they're not going to see, or I guess show them that, and then let, no, sure why. let me take back, you know, show them what I say, and then when they've seen it for a minute, then you can mm -hmm. cut back into me. Uh, I'd rather you see the, the PowerPoint, but you all tell me it helps to see. That's not going to work. Okay. Um, what I'm trying to remind us, us, us of is where we've come, and I'm going to just ignore the fact that there are different things going on. Hopefully it will come out where you will like what you are seeing. Um, I don't know why things changed, but Lord help us learn our technology and be able to use it in a good way. I, I see, um, a re well, maybe I just don't need to worry about what I'm seeing. I just don't want it hurting your eyes. It's supposed to be. Do whatever you think is best. Just you go ahead and do what you think is best for them. We are in that building that you saw a few moments ago. We had looked at the first piece of furniture in the holy place. We are in the, we've come just through that second entrance. The second entrance represented the truth. Our first entrance brought us into the courtyard. It was I am, and that's the great I am, and it's he speaking. Our Messiah, our Savior, very God Himself, who said, I am the, the way, and He brings us the way into the, the court. And then we've come into the building, we've come through that first opening there, represented by I am the truth. We know that's the second part of Yochanan, John 14, verse 6, I am the way, I am the truth. And we will get all the way to our, think, I think we'll get to our third opening. Uh, this evening, but being in just the holy place, we're going to go uh, to the PowerPoint that we left off last time, the altar of incense. There it is on the right. Okay, then you can... Okay, altar of incense. There we go. That's where we left off last time. And I just want to remind you that that... For any of you who were struggling to hear me, my apologies. I'm sure you're hearing better now, except we've got a little bit of a feedback. If you, maybe it's going away. Okay. Uh, now I can hear almost a high-pitched whirring sound, Roger, in my ear. And uh, again, my apologies for our n not being up on our technology. It is a learning curve for us. Uh, but now, uh, hopefully, good. Hopefully you're hearing me well. The altar of incense is... Uh, as you can see on the split screen, if you look on the side where you see the curtain, it's just in front of the curtain. That is not the curtain that we've come through. That's the curtain that leads into the most holy of holies place. It is the one that we will be uh, going through as we continue on our way. Uh, but the, the reason why we're seeing it in relation to that curtain is you need to know what's right on the other side of that curtain. What is immediately on the other side of the curtain is the mercy seat. 
And what I want you to see is the close relation of the altar of incense to the mercy seat. That uh, there's almost an interaction, even though the, the curtain at this point in our picture is closed, there's almost an interaction. And that's because the altar does bear a close relation to that mercy seat. It's the instrument by which we receive mercy uh, from the, th the throne. I'm sorry, from, okay, let me try that again. I'm still a little sidetracked trying to, to hope that our pictures are, are good for you. What I'm trying to say is we receive mercy from the mercy seat. How do we come into the presence of that mercy is through our prayers. That as the penitent sinner turns to, you want me to move over? Nobody. He wants me to move. There you go. Okay, and we've still got that yeah. ringing coming back in my ears. Uh, okay, as we as sinners bring our, our prayers to the Father, asking for that forgiveness, that opens the way into the mercy seat for us because when we come through the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus, we come into His very presence and we know that He dwelt in the, the Holy of Holies. Uh, but my point being right now with that altar of incense that we first, uh, it's our prayer that ushers us into that presence of our holy God. Forgive me, I'm very sidetracked because, Roger, I've got to ask you, I, it's, it's mm -hmm. high-pitched okay. in my ear, and it, it's a squeal now. In fact, it's worse since I moved over. So I don't know if it's the relation giving the feedback, but it definitely has to be. That's what you're hearing. That's where well, it I is. Hear that, but okay, is it because forward. I'm directly in front of it now? Okay. Okay, that's good. Maybe it was just that wire. Okay, my apologies. No, it's coming, it's right back, and it's a squeal again. I you I don't think anybody else can hear Okay. I have no way of knowing if they're hearing it because I can't see anyone. Okay, I'm just going to trust that it's good and the Lord's going to help me ignore it. I'm going to just have to forget that it is there. If you see me grimace, it's because it went to a high, high uh, level. And uh, I'm wondering if I can do anything soon at an angle. Maybe, let me try that. <laughs> okay, it's out of my ear for the moment. So, we have... Ooh, I'm sorry. We have the altar. We've had our prayers that are mixed with the incense. The incense is the smoke that you saw going up when it showed the curtain in front of it. And uh, that's just reminding us of our prayers being lifted up. They were told to burn incense, but no strange incense was ever to be burned on it. That means that we don't bring anything else to our God. We don't bring our own works, we don't bring our own sacrifices, we don't bring anything. We come only through the shed blood of Messiah that enters or opens the entrance for us into the very presence of our God. What I'd like to do is go to our next PowerPoint slide. If Roger's able, he's trying to troubleshoot for me, but if he's able, we're going to go to the table of showbread. Roger, are you able to come up with our next slide? The table of showbread is in that same uh, room with the altar that remember now the altar is right in front of the curtain we're going to look at the two pieces of furniture on the sides there they are to, to give you the overview we're going to look first at the table of showbread and then we will look at the menorah the lampstand uh, the candlestick whatever word you are accustomed to when we look at the table of showbread we're going to see that it is on the north side so if you're trying to get your bearings in here it's on the north and the table of showbread speaks to us of the fellowship and the communion. Remember, when we come in through our prayers, we come into uh, this, the presence of the Lord. We will sense His fellowship with us, and we are uh, given the opportunity to commune with Him. As we look at our next slide, we should see a large, there we go, of this. And again, there are different uh, renditions, different uh, versions different artists that, that see it a bit differently. But what we all know is according to Shemot, to Exodus chapter 25, verses 23 through 30, the materials to make it were wood overlaid with gold. Remember, wood spoke to his humanity, his humility, and his uh, taking on human form. And the gold is his deity, the fact that even though he was fully man, he still was fully God and worthy of our praise, worthy of being our king. 
So we see in the mixture of the two, we see his incarnation, his coming into our human race because that's the basis of the fellowship that we have that he can relate to us and we to him because he was like us. He understands our feelings. He knew what it was to grow tired or to grow weary, to be discouraged. Well, I don't know if discouragement is right for the Lord, but uh, he understands our human emotions is what I'm trying to say. Notice the structure around the top was like a golden crown placed around the top. And again, it reminds us that he was crowned with glory. And we read that last week. We studied it a lot in Hebrews chapter 1, where it spoke about him being made a little lower than the angels. That's what is meant when he took on human form. But that he did that, that he might taste death for us, because in humanity he tasted death. In deity he did not. God does not die. It was the human man, that uh, the body that was laid in the grave, that he conquered death and rose again and is crowned with glory. We know he is seated at the right hand of the Father, crowned with glory, waiting for that time to return when all of his enemies have been made his footstool. The purpose with the bread, uh, actually the priests would eat that bread. And we'll see that, that this was sustenance for them. And we know that we feed or we meditate on Yeshua himself, who is the bread of life. And so it's, he is our food for us. I'm going to take you to John, Yochanan, chapter 6 and verse 35. And we start there where Yeshua was speaking. This is during his earthly life when he was walking on this earth among the Talmudim and others in Yerushalayim, in Israel. And he said to them, I am our great phrase again and then he took it the next step I am the bread of life he who comes to me will not hunger and he who believes in me will never thirst dropping down in that same chapter Yochanan John chapter 6 and we're going to verse 47 and I read to you there truly truly or yes indeed I tell you whoever trusts has eternal life I am the bread which is life your fathers ate the man or the man in the desert and they died, but the bread that comes down from heaven is such that a person may eat it and do not die. Verse 51, I am the living bread that has come down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. Furthermore, the bread that I will give is my own flesh, and I will give it to I will give it for the life of the world. So we see very clearly that he's referring to himself as the very bread of life. He is what is, gives us life as we feed on him. We are nourished as we meditate on him. We have uh, all that we need to, uh, to meet our every need and to fulfill us, to fill us. Um, it's quite a picture that is being drawn here. As I go on, I think that, that more will be said. Um, Roger, if they're not able to see me, if you can flip back now, they've seen this picture long enough, I, it, it might help if they can go back and forth. They can't hear you very well. They cannot hear me well. They hear you very well. They do. Okay, okay. Hopefully it looks good also. Um, if you're seeing me and not the PowerPoint, we'll go back and forth to the PowerPoint as I bring out um, something new for you to see. But, I wanted you to be able to have the personal content that you told me you want and that I like. <laughs> um, the, it is called the showbread. That can be spelled from the old English, but I like to prefer to give you the spelling in the new English of today's time, and that's S-H-O-W-B-R-E-A-D, showbread. There were 12 loaves, if you remember from the picture, and that was representative of the 12 tribes. We're going to go back to Viacra, to Leviticus, and I am on a different uh, system here. Hopefully this is going to work quickly for us. We're going to Leviticus chapter 24, and we will look at verses 5 and 6. In Leviticus 24 and verse 5 we read, Then you shall take fine flour and bake twelve cakes with it. Two tenths of an ephah shall be in each cake. You shall set them in two rows, six to a row, on the pure gold table before the Lord. So we know, uh, and because this was the instructions in the tabernacle time, we know that, that what you just saw is a picture that someone has drawn from that. But I'll take you into a little bit more of the meaning. When it says showbread, it literally also says the presence bread or the bread of the face. 
again the idea that, that we're being right, brought right into the very presence of our Holy God, that we are being given FaceTime, shall I say. It's a word we can relate to today. In fact, we're looking for FaceTime right now. Uh, being the bread of the face, it's reminding us that He is the one who we are to be looking to, who we want that time with, and He has His face toward us. We see that we, His people, are constantly in His remembrance, and He is there to feed us. Now, when they made the bread, they made it with fine flour, and uh, the directions are given again in Leviticus 24, but let me just bring out, uh, there are two different points here that I'll be bringing out to us. The first is that it was made of fine flour, and some believe that it was made without leaven, which would speak of his holy life, and when it was baked, it would speak of the fire of judgment. It would remind us of the suffering that he did for us. And they take this and they correlate it with, uh, and if you want, read further in Viacra and Leviticus 24 to see where they're told in the instruction, but they take that to 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 and 24, where many people draw on our communion today when they, they take the bread and they uh, drink the, the juice, they're referring to this, and, and th let me read it for you, it's easier than saying it, when we go to 1 Corinthians, which was written by Shaol, Paul, and it was written to people who lived in Corinth, this would be a mixture of Jewish and Gentile believers, we're going to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and verse 23, and we read there, for I received, let's see, whoops, I'm sorry, okay, for what I received from the Lord is just what I passed on to you, that the Lord Yeshua, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. After that, he made the barucha, the, the blessing, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this as a memorial to me. Now, we know that that comes out of where, where we have studied it, we know it was the Passover Seder. On the basis of that, they believe that it was unleavened bread and that that is a picture then again of the holiness of our Lord because he lived a holy and a sinless life. Let me take you to one other verse and that is Yochanan. I should have told you to keep a, a finger there. We're going to be a lot in John if I remember right, so you might want to keep a marker there. This time we're going to chapter 12 and to verse 24. And in John 12 and verse 24, we read, Yes, indeed, I tell you that unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it stays just a grain. But if it dies, it produces a big harvest. Uh, another version speaks about it producing life eternal. So in those pictures, we see that Yeshua easily could be referring to his death. And as we are, in essence, we die with him, we're buried with him, and he brings us into that resurrection, that newness of life. And that would be a beautiful picture if it is uh, related to us in, um, in the sense of being unleavened. But again, as I said, there's controversy over that. There's also the belief that this was lechem. Lechem is bread that has the, the uh, yeast in it. It would be like our hollow loaves that we enjoy. And because it's not called in scripture matzah, it doesn't refer to it as unleavened bread back in Viacra where I read for you, that is why they believe that it is lechem. And if it's lechem, we still have a beautiful picture here because we are still seeing that we are reminded that Yeshua is our bread, that he is our sustenance. Bread speaks to sustenance. If you have bread, it's considered that you have a meal. In fact, in Jewish tradition, if you eat bread at all, then you have to have certain blessings said afterward because you've had a complete meal, whether that's all you eat or whether you eat more also. And uh, daily we need to eat bread, and daily we need to be uh, drawing from the life that Yeshua gives to us. And uh, we know that it can be a picture of him in that sense. If it has leaven in it, it's never a picture of our Lord, but it could be a picture of him providing for us and being our daily sustenance and what we need to always feed on. Uh, it also, because there's 12 loaves, it reminds us of the 12 tribes, and our 12 tribes would have been very human beings who had sin in their lives, just as, as every human does. No one 
except for our Lord himself has lived a sinless life. So if it's a picture of our 12 tribes, which some say, and, and we can see that and understand that also, then that would be why it would be lechem. It would be bread that has leaven in it. There was frankincense that would be mixed along in the fire. The bread wouldn't be, but the, the frankincense would be poured into the fire. As that would happen, smoke would come up again like the incense, again a mixture of our, our prayer. So we can see a combining of, of these two uh, together uh, as we are in the same room, the presence and the feeding are both there also. Lastly, I'd like to point out that it was renewed every Shabbat, and that's in uh, Viacra, Leviticus chapter 24 and verse 8, that they would always be replaced, and it is believed that the loaves that were taken away are what the priests would eat, and yet God had miraculously kept it warm and kept it fresh, and that it was good for them, and it was always satisfying. Well, we know when we feed on him, he always satisfies. No matter our need, no matter what, he is always satisfying and fulfilling to us. So as we move from our, our um, showbread now, we'll go back to that PowerPoint and we'll look at our next PowerPoint as Roger is calling it up. It is our candle stand and it, we find the instruction for it in Shemot, Exodus chapter 37, verses 17 to 24 and in chapter 25, verses 31 through 34. Remember, we get the instruction and the construction of the, uh, the, the tabernacle and all of its pieces. So this one, uh, this candlestick, and, and again, you'll see all kinds of variations in different artists, uh, but I chose this one for some of the detail that you can see, I think, a little easier than some others. There are no measurements given to the candle stand. We do not know the height. We do not know how thick. We just know that they were to make it from a talent of pure gold. Shemot, Exodus 37, 4 tells us that, and also chapter 25, the verses I gave earlier refer to it. Now, in the mid-20th century, that talent of gold was about $29,000. Well, hold on if you think that's something, because... In June of 2018, a gram costs $38, and there's about 72 pounds, and when they, you go from the, the grams into the pounds, the bottom line is a talent in June of 2018 cost approximately $1,400,116, and that day, 57 cents. <laughs> wow, this was very costly, it, I'm sure it was very beautiful, it is interesting that the Temple Mount Faithful have made a, a menorah, a candle stand for the temple for today. When they are able to have their temple again, they have one ready. If you go to Israel, you go to the Western Wall in the plaza of the Western Wall, protected under uh, glass and sealed and um, extremely protected, you see the candle stand today. I don't have the measurements of it, I just can tell you it is much taller than I am and it is gorgeous. Um, it is interesting, all this gold and all this silver all the way through the tabernacle made this very expensive. Remember they came out with the gold and silver out of Egypt that it was in essence God gave them their wages for all the years they've been slaves I feel by the, what they came out with, the wealth they came out with. The gold and the silver for the temple today are, is valued at over $13 million. I believe that's why it took time for them to build all the different uh, pieces of the furniture and be able to be ready, but they have completed all of the pieces are made today that are ready to go into the third temple once it is uh, established. If you go to Israel today and you go to the Temple Mount Faithful, you go to our Temple Mount Institute, I'm sorry, the people are called the Temple Mount Faithful. They will uh, show you through um, a slideshow and through going from room to room, they will show you the very pieces. And uh, it is quite spectacular to see it. It gives us a, an inkling of the beauty of the tabernacle that uh, otherwise we wouldn't really understand today. Now, where it was placed was on the south wall. Remember, it was across from the table of showbread that we just looked at. And in this holy place, remember, there's a holy of holies, but in just the holy place, it would, well, in fact, actually in the whole thing, it is the only light in the tabernacle. 
and that it definitely is a picture uh, to us of Yeshua who is the light of the world. We know that he said that in Yochanan, John chapter 8. We're going to go back to Yochanan and we're going to go to, um, well, we'll look at chapter 8 first since we're at 12. We can work our way backwards. Yochanan, John chapter 8 and verse 12 and we read in his words, even though we've been saying it many a time, we read, Yeshua spoke to them again, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light, which gives life. And then when we understand that he's saying that he's that light that gives that life, it helps us understand the very first chapter of Yochanan even more. We'll go all the way back to John chapter 1, and as you're going back there, we're going to focus on verses 4 and 9, but I will remind you, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. When we drop down to verse 14, we find that the word tabernacled with us, and we're understanding that tabernacling in a whole new way as we look through each individual part. It, um, you might, well, we'll never mind. Um, verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. Verse 9, this was the true light, which gives light to everyone entering into the world. So as we put these thoughts together, we realize he's not only the light of the world that brings light, the people who sat in darkness saw a great light, according to Yeshua, Isaiah, that we also see that that light gives life, and he is the life of man, that he gives us that eternal living life. What a beautiful picture it is of him. And in his beauty, we see the beauty of this candlestick. It is pure gold. That reminds us of his deity, that he is fully God himself. And it was made, it's called a beaten work, B-E-A-T-E-N. It was beaten, they, they, um, the way that they worked with the gold when it was soft, it was beaten, and that's a picture or an emblem to remind us of his suffering, that he suffered for us, but in his suffering, the beauty comes out, because once he had gone through death, when he came out, in glorious resurrection he came out in all of his beauty and that light that that emanates from the candle stand reveals the beauty brings that beauty forth so as we continue to look at it being a picture of him it's right and fitting that it's gold only uh, and that it uh, is beaten but yet there is a beauty and as a light as if it were to be lit it would bring even a greater beauty to it the structure of it was one shaft. If you look, and that's why we left it on the screen for you, if you look, there's one shaft in the middle. Everything else feel, uh, comes out from that, is connected to it. Remember, it is one piece only. The shaft is the preeminent part, and this is the very part that would be Messiah, Yeshua. He is preeminent. Colossians. The book that Shaul Paul wrote to those who lived in Colossae, Colossians chapter 1, tells us in verse 18 that he is that preeminent one. And the way it puts it here in this verse, it says, Also he, meaning Yeshua, is the head of the body, the messianic community. He's the beginning, the first form from the dead, so he might hold first place in everything. Or he might have the preeminence in everything. That is who our Messiah is. That shaft, that main uh, line, the main part, the, the main, well, shaft, I don't know what else to call it, it will be lit first, and it's through its light that all the others are lit. Even when they use the oil, the oil goes through in such a way that it comes from this main shaft. And you'll notice that there are six branches, three on each side of the shaft. That reminds us of man, because... The number given for man in scripture is six. And in man, when he comes in and becomes a part, one with his shaft, becomes one with Messiah Yeshua, then it's referring to believing man or, or the believers. And that makes us think since uh, we, if you held a finger in, in John, go, if you didn't go back to it, Yochanan John chapter 15 and verse 5. And in that scripture we read, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who stay united with me and I with them are the ones who bear much fruit, because apart from me, you can't do a thing. And we know if this were a vine, the branches that become separated die off. 
but as long as they stay connected to the vine, then they are fed continually. This middle shaft, the main shaft, feeds the others continually. We also see the meaning in Hebrews. Remember our book written to our Hebrew people by Sheol, I believe, in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 11. We read, I'll be right there, Hebrews 2 and 11. We read, For both Yeshua, who sets people apart for God, and the ones being set apart for God, have a common origin. This is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. That we come into him when we become a part of him. He literally calls us his brethren. We are joint heirs with him. That's uh, the beauty of being tied in, being part of that one shaft. Now, the, the next point is to realize, again, what I'm stressing, that these are not fastened on. They're not tied on. They're not separate pieces that came and then were added on. These were fastened out of that same beaten goal. So as it was being formed, these were being brought out and made into this shape so that they are literally one part with him. They cannot ever stand alone. They are never separate. Uh, let's look at 1 Corinthians again. And we were there before, but we'll go back to Corinth and we'll see in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12. Again, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 12, we read there. For just as the body is one that has many parts, and all the parts of the body, though many constitute one body, so it is with the Messiah. So another way we refer to it is for those who are believers today that we make up one body. The head of that body, the one who is preeminent, that would be Yeshua himself. I believe that's what Philippians 3.10 says. We'll take a quick peek right around the corner from 1 Corinthians. Go to Philippians, one of those little books. Verse 10, if you can't turn quickly, I will just read it for you. And verse 10 says, Yes, I gave it all up in order to know him, that is to know the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings as I am being conformed to his death. So Shaul Paul was saying that he's being conformed, he's becoming a part of, because we come in through our faith, we come in through believing and accepting him as our Messiah and our Savior, but then it's as if we are one with him, that we are conformed through our sufferings, and that uh, even when we go through the physical death, we know that we still have been given that resurrection, as verse 11 says, somehow I might arrive at being resurrected from the dead. Well, that somehow, that's by the power of the one who was resurrected before us, the one who we call first fruits. And we'll celebrate that in a very short time when we celebrate Shavuot coming up next on our calendar. But um, again, as we look at this, it's not um, fastened on, but out of the same beaten gold, it's beaten again because we also suffer. We suffer persecution and we suffer the death of ourselves that we might come into the newness of his life, the fullness of his life. Chapter, um, I'm sorry, uh, rather than let me say this first before I take you, I'm going to ask Roger to start going back away from the picture so we can have that eye contact again. But as he does notice, and he took it a little fast, but that's okay. Uh, hopefully you were noticing what looked like a form, and that would be like almonds and like little buds that were with those almonds. Uh, that is to remind us of uh, uh, what almonds speak of in Scripture. Now, we see that they were told to make them like almonds in Shemot, in Exodus 37, the instructions that were given. But the meaning behind it, we look at Numbers, Bar chapter 17 and verse 8 and there we read okay now on the next day Moshe went into the tent of the testimony he went into the Mishkan he went into the tabernacle and behold the rod of Aharon for the house of Levi had sprouted and put forth buds and produced blossoms and it bore ripe almonds now if you don't know the history behind that verse just simply go back later on your own and read the first five verses of Bab Midbar of Numbers chapter 17. What you're reading about then is Korah had thought that, that uh, and he was of the, the Levites, but he thought that Aharon and Moshe were taking too much on themselves, that they were taking uh, too much, it was, it was them and it was their say. 
He didn't feel that that was fair. He thought that it should be spread out among other people. Of course, Moshe and Haram were only following what God was telling them they were to be. Moshe, the head leader, and now Haram, like the high priest, because the priest would come out from, uh, from him. But uh, what God told them to do was for each tribe to take a representative, put the name on a stick, put all the sticks in the temple, and the next day when they went back in to see what had happened, all the other sticks were still like dead sticks, and here was a Haron's in the description I just read to you. It had budded, it had brought forth blossoms, and it even had ripe almonds on it. That was a picture, a symbol of resurrection. It was a symbol of new life. Now, it's interesting that the almond tree is one of the first trees to flower in the springtime, and they do call it a symbol of resurrection. They also call it the awakener. It awakens them to the fact spring is coming, it is really here. And the word in Hebrew, shached, means to be diligent, to strive, to be steadfast. And I believe all of this is a picture for us as we're diligent but, and striving, but doing it in His resurrection power. As we come into that newness of life, as we lose our lives, we gain His life. And we gain that resurrection power that He has for us. Uh, if you remember that you saw the little bumps on the, the um, <laughs> I can't think of the word, but on different branches, there we go. There are in scripture what it's called, and Roger's bringing it back up because I'm struggling, there you go. Uh, there are bowls, and if you have an old English, you'll have the word knops, K-N-O-P-S, that means bulbs. Today we call it bulbs when we talk about planting bulbs in our garden and the flowers that come out of it. Uh, and it talks about those blossoms. And again, what we're seeing is the beauty of resurrection. Uh, let me also take you not only the beauty that we read in Bud Midbar and Numbers, but we'll also go to 1 Corinthians. And in 1 Corinthians, we're going to go this time to chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Um, and Roger, I think you can go back to our eye contact for a little bit now because I won't need to refer to them looking at it, I think. Hopefully I'm not leading you wrong. 1 Corinthians 15, we're going to start with verse 20. And we read, But the fact is that the Messiah has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have died. For since death came through a man, also the resurrection of the dead has come through a man. For just as in connection with Adam all die, so in connection with the Messiah all will be made alive. What we are seeing and what's being referred to is the fact that because Yeshua took on that human form, he became one like us. He's referred to in another place in Scripture as the second Adam, or the second Adam. He came and he fulfilled what Adam did not. Because Adam sinned, sin entered into the human race, and it took one coming into the human race to redeem us from the wage of sin, which is death. And that's why we see in this that because Messiah became a man, connected with us, as if he had come from Adam. We, yet we know he, he came from God because he was God. In that sense, in his resurrection, he is able to give us that resurrection power also. So it speaks to the, the beauty of the resurrection. Now, uh, there were seven lamps lit on it. Each one of those branches, the three on each side that you saw, all had a lamp at the top and the one middle shaft that feeds all of the others also had a light shining. So there would be seven lamps or seven lights on the one menorah. I'm not talking about seven different candle stands, I'm talking about one that had seven lamps. And because we know this is a picture of Yeshua, we need to think what could the meaning of that be. And we realize that we have our triune God. We have spoken much about the deity of our Lord, that he's fully human, that he's fully God. And we've referred to that time and again. We have Yehovah, God the Father, and we have um, Yeshua, God the Son. But there's a third part to our triune God, and we know that to be the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. Well, it's very interesting that when we look at the government or the working of the Spirit in Scripture, uh, according to our prophet Yeshaya, Isaiah, in chapter 11 and verse 2, we read that the spirit of Adonai, and now he will do there are seven things listed he will do. The spirit of Adonai will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, 
the spirit of counsel and power, the spirit of knowledge and fearing Adonai. He will be inspired by fearing Adonai. Verse 3 says, what we see is called the sevenfold working of the Holy Spirit who brings us wisdom, understanding, who cancels us, who gives us power, the knowledge, the fear of our God and the Spirit He Himself is in us to bring the light out of us also. So in the seven lamps we see the sevenfold work of the Ruach HaKodesh. So again we have a beautiful picture of our triune God. Now remember the branches, each are made of the same material. They're made one with Him. They are also, as we said earlier, beaten, uh, made out of the, the same beaten gold. And, oops, sorry, we thought that was under control. That's what happens when you zoom from a living room. <laughs> and uh, the fact that they were um, beaten show that we share in his sufferings. I think I read to you also, but in case if I didn't, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10 says yes i oh maybe i didn't read this to you this is all paul's uh sharing his testimony also and he says that i may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death yes i think i did read that for us that we through our sufferings are conformed into his image and so the beaten reminds us of the suffering we're made out of the same strength of material because we have Messiah's strength in us. That's Philippians chapter 4. If you held your finger at 3, just simply go to chapter 4 and verse 13. And we read in Philippians 4, 13, and I know this verse well, but I want to read it so I don't say it wrong. Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through him who gives me power or who gives me strength. We have Messiah, Mashiach's strength when we are one in Him so that we are able to face our trials. We are able to face a coronavirus that has us locked behind doors. We are able to face a financial difficulty because of it. Whatever we are facing, we have the Messiah's strength to help us, the wisdom of the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, to guide us. And we will see that He will bring us forth in beauty. We have that same beauty when we're showing His beauty. When we become more like Him, when we reflect Him, then people see His beauty in us and we're told that, that we should do the good works like Him, that they might see our Father in heaven and it glorify Him. How can that be? Well, remember Yeshua is the express image of our Father. He and the Father are one and it's more exacting than a mirror replication. So when we are like Him, we're also like the Father. So when we are doing the works full of His Spirit, His power, and, and conforming to His image, then our light will reflect our Father in Heaven and we will glorify Him. We are going to look just real quickly at the, the conclusion of this um, fascinating piece of furniture. We're going to notice that that oil that we've been talking about that fills all the lights in Scripture, the oil is a picture of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. We get this from 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19 and 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. And pardon me, I've got to spell it right to get it on my little smartphone here. 1 Corinthians 6. Chapter 6 and verse 19 we read, almost, okay. Or don't you know that your body is a temple? Now remember the temple is the permanent, the tabernacle was the temporary. Your body is a temple or a tabernacle for the Ruch HaKodesh, for the Holy Spirit who lives inside you, whom you receive from God. The fact is you don't belong to yourselves. You were bought at a price. So your bodies, use your bodies to glorify God. That's 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20, and we see that in that candlestick. Again, remember that, that we are Him, we belong to Him, we are part of Him, and we should glorify Him in our actions. And again, then remember, in, coming out of those bulbs and out of those um, decorations there, we would see the almond blossoms again reminding us of that resurrection life and that takes us back to Yochanan to John chapter 14 and verse 19 in John 14 verse 19 we read in just a little while the world will no longer see me but you will see me because I live you too will live 
Remember the almond spoke of resurrection, the new beauty, the, the new life that comes out. And that's what he is telling us. We will have new life with him one day. I remember hearing my mom say time and time again as her body was failing, she couldn't wait to get her new body. Our resurrected bodies will not suffer pain. They will not decay. They will not age. They will never hurt. They will uh, be able to, to not be confined to gravity into one space. Uh, everything that you see Yeshua do in scripture after he resurrected from the dead gives us an idea of what it will be like. I'd love to just stay on that thought and focus on that thought for a time, but I see the time fleeing, and I want to finish our thought here. Uh, uh, yes, I can finish this quickly of what our oil is representing. Again, it gives the light that reveals the beauty of the candle stand. The Holy Spirit did not come for him to be seen. He did not come for it to be his beauty that is seen. He came to reflect Yeshua's, and we're told that. In, if you stayed, uh, hopefully, in John in chapter 14, just move over to chapter 16, and we're going to look real quickly at Yochanan John 16, verses 13 and 14. And this is what the Spirit came to do. However, when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth, for He will not speak on His own initiative, but will say only what He hears. He will also announce to you the events of the future. He will glorify me, and this is Yeshua speaking, because he will receive from what is mine and announce it to you. What we're being told is that the Holy Spirit, the Ruch HaKodesh, would reveal to us, to his Talmudim, he reminded them of what Yeshua had taught them, because now much more was going to be understood as they went on after the time that, that they had with Yeshua when he had ascended into heaven and the Holy Spirit came. He said he'll bring back to remembrance to your mind all that I've taught you. And for those of us who have not been alive at that day, we're taught through the scriptures, which it is the Ruch HaKodesh who opens up those scriptures to us, gives us that understanding of what we are reading so that we know and understand that it speaks of Yeshua and it reflects our God. It was to be a continual light always burning in the tabernacle. That's in uh, Viacra, Leviticus chapter 24, verses 2 through 4. And as we know that it is to be eternal, never to be distinguished, that is a picture of the one who is the light of the world, Yachanan 8.12, and he is the eternal light of the world, that his light is never extinguished. In uh, concluding points, we notice also the lamps of this candle stand were trimmed by the high priest. You can read that on your own in Viacra in Leviticus chapter 24, the first four verses about. We'll, we'll talk to you about how the priests were the ones that trimmed them. And it's our high priest who trims us, so to speak. What I'm referring to is John chapter 15. You're right there. Just go right around the corner to chapter 15 and verse 1. And again, I read this earlier, but I'll read a couple more verses. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. Verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. And again, we're reminded of how we are part of that main shaft, and that in that, the light flows through in that we're able to work and to do and to be and to shine a reflection of the one true, the eternal light of the world. Apart from him, we would die off. We could not do anything of our own. Now, only the priests saw this beauty, the beauty of Yeshua, but when we ask the Lord into our lives and we become his, then he says that he makes us priests. Remember, we're a new kingdom of priests that are made uh, for him and then as we do the work of the priest we will see his beauty and we will be rewarded also in his beauty shining through us I'm taking you in conclusion to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14 and 16 Matthew 5 Mattathiah chapter 5 and verse 14 you are the light for the world a town built on a hill cannot be hidden and verse 16 in the same way, let your light so shine before people so that they may see the good things you do and praise your Father in heaven. That's the verse I had referred to a little earlier. There was a city on a hill called Safat. 
Safat was a very religious city and it still is to this day. They're full of a lot of superstition also though mixed in with it. A lot of Kabbalah comes into their believing. But it is believed that it could be that Yeshua even pointed to that city on the hill that they would see lit every night. That could not be hidden because of the light from within the community and that the idea given to us, our light, should not be able to be hidden so that the world can see the light of Yeshua. When we're one with Him and one in Him, then we truly can reveal Him and we can be like little lights, like the little ones on the side that draw our, our um, from the Spirit. We draw our oil from the Ruch HaKodesh as He empowers us then our light can shine brightly, that people will see who, they will see Mashiach, the eternal light of the world, they will see Yehovah, our Father in heaven, it will glorify Him, and He will receive the praise. So in this very room now, we have the incense, the prayer re, re, um, interacting with the mercy seat that we know that we're going to see shortly, but we see the, the incense reminding us that our prayers do go up to heaven, that they are not bound here on earth, but that our very God hears us, that his eyes are turned toward us. In this room also where we bring in our prayers as we come into the presence of our God, we are reminded that he is our sustenance, he is our bread of life, he feeds us daily, that we need to be eating from him, and that he brings to us all the light that we need, and as we reflect his light, we get to show that light to the world. So we have a beautiful picture of who we are in relation to our Lord and what he wants of us to do in this little room. When we come together next time, we'll have the exciting time of going through the inner veil. We'll talk about what that veil means, and we will look at what is on the inside of that veil. If you don't know, take a sneak peek. You can cheat and you can go read ahead. It, to me, is the most exciting piece of furniture in all of our uh, tabernacle because it's of the greatest importance. And if you don't know why, you'll find out next week that uh, there is something, I think, very special coming. And it will be wonderful to go into that inner veil all the way. We've come from the foot of the cross, and we're going to be all the way to the top and the culmination there of what this has all been pointing to and a picture of. And we'll see the fullness of the meaning of the one piece of furniture in the tabernacle. But uh, I trust as you are walking through this, you are growing in it. And as we come uh, closer to the very presence of our Lord in the picture, we know that we're already in his presence. Let his light so shine through you that uh, we can share with others. And hopefully they will want what they see in us because it will glorify our Father. And we can all become one with that candlestick. And we will all have the joy of what comes behind the veil. So come back next week to find out what's behind the veil. <laughs>